This is the Drummers Only Podcast, brought to you by the UK's leading drum store. Good afternoon, good evening, good good night, wherever you are. Uh, Drummers Only Podcast, episode number 65. And we're welcoming on the wonderful Kenny Sharrits. Good evening, Kenny. Good evening, sir. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm looking forward to talking to you. Um, if you don't know Kenny, we've got so he's a little different today. But Kenny is not a drummer as such that we have had on. He is a pro drum tech, a drummer. Uh, he's got an amazing, amazing YouTube channel and amazing social game with all this wonderful content. He teaches tech lessons. Um. And I'm just going to rhyme off uh, some of his credits um, so y'all know that Homeboy's not messing around here. He's, uh, he's played and he's worked with some <laughs> wonderful people. So he's, he's currently working with Dead & Co, with Mickey Hart. He's worked with Elvis Costello, whose drummer is Pete Thomas. He's worked for Stevie Wonder, who has had Stanley Randolph, Chris Johnson, Little John Roberts, and of course Stevie Wonder playing drums. He's worked with Janet Jackson, who had Lil John Roberts, Puff Daddy with Eric Boots Green, Rex Hardy, Gerald Hayward, and Lamont Snyder, Train with Scott Underwood and Drew Scholes, Rihanna with Chris Johnson, Enrique Iglesias with Van Romain. He was the bass tech on 30 Seconds of Mars, Aaron Spears' gig on American Idols Live, Kelly Clarkson with Derek Wyatt, Josh Stone, and Kenny Aronoff. Uh, yeah, so there's some names there. <laughs> There's some names there. I will pick them up later, for I've just dropped them all. But uh, that's quite the CV already, man. That is quite the CV. Well, thank you very much, man. I got to be honest, I've been truly blessed in my career, man. You know, you start out being a drummer, uh, doing it because you love it, it's what you want to be. But certain opportunities come into your life, and you, you just can't say no, mm. uh, even if it was just to have the experience. And that experience turned into a career. And uh, I can't say it's a bad thing at all, man. I've, I've been blessed to travel the world, meet a lot of amazing people, work for some of my idols as well as study under them mm. and then bring what I learned there home to the work I do here in Austin, Texas. And uh, I think that's how it's supposed to be. Everything's supposed to feed the other when it comes to being an artist and a musician. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the most boring questions in the world is always, how did you start? Because you obviously don't, I mean, I don't know if you did, but I don't think many people have the sort of, I'm going to go out there and be a tech. Well, it's funny. You'd be surprised. This day and age, especially, a lot of people have. Oh, really? There's a lot of okay. people who love their instrument, um, but they realize they ain't the one, you know? And I've stood in front of some of Stevie's drummers going, oh, oh okay, well, <laughs> I get it now. I yeah. get it. I mean, I'm a good drummer. I can play gigs. I do all right. But when you stand in front of Stanley Randolph, when he's, mm. um, pop, you know, when he's popping up, <laughs> Aaron Spears when he's just yeah. getting into it you realize there's certain drummers that are just to another level mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of players have come to that situation or they love music but they're into the technical side they want to do audio they want to do lighting mm -hmm. they want to be a part of the show and creating the, the moment that people come to the show for they want to be a part of that because they love it so much mm -hmm. and so for me it was a matter of I was making music here in Austin Texas uh, playing in a lot of bands and I met um, a cat through a guy who used to tech for me when my band was on 6th Street kicking it. We were going to make it, bro. <laughs> uh, we had residencies. It was happening. But one of my dear friends, uh, Spider Wallace, who is now with Kid Rock, uh, was teching for me. And then he became a tech. Mm. Uh, he went out there and like muscled out, just told Peter Chris, you need a tech when he saw him at a show one night. <laughs> and Peter goes, if you're here on this spot, on this freeway at this time in the morning when we're leaving town, You've got a gig, and Spider was there, bro. And it taught me a valuable lesson on the spot in life and later on in my career as a tech that if you're going to do this, do it. Don't say you're going to do it. Just do it. And uh, I think that's a lot of the reasons I've had success in my career, just that one lesson learned from Spider. But later in years, he introduced me to a guy named Trace Foster uh, who moved to Austin, and he and his wife were doing music, and we were writing songs together. And during that time, he was in a band with a guy named Gary Steer, and they were doing a South by Southwest showcase. And uh, Kenny Aronoff was the drummer on the, the album. Mike Campbell was playing guitar. Ben Montench played some keys. It was a mm -hmm. Danny Korchmar production. I mean, it was, it was a real deal, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
But for Sapphire, they just needed to do drummer, bassist, and background vocalist. So, you know, I booked a rehearsal place, the PA, got everything organized, rehearsed that part of the band, got everyone ready in the material. We went and did the show. And my friend Trace realized, hey, man, I had the skill set that it would take to be a tech. And Kenny Aronoff needed a tech on the tour he was about to do because he was a guitar tech with Melissa Etheridge. And so, you know, they asked me the inevitable question. Hey, man, uh, you want a tech for Kenny Aronoff on this tour? (laughs) <laughs> which of course right right dude i mean just the laugh alone i hear from your voice it's the truth bro unless your band is slaying if all of a sudden you ain't doing nothing on a tuesday somebody goes hey man you want to check drums for kenny aaron off i think you can and you're like yeah i could do it <laughs> oh my god dude uh i mean definition of green head to toe and they they took it they taught me and they were great but they were also brutal as they should be you know, mm. it's not like they should just hang. You shouldn't just do two shows. <laughs> yeah, I'm a great tech. It takes time, mm. and you need to learn the rules of the road and how it's done, how to tour, and how to travel on a tour bus. That alone is half the gig. Right. Right. Uh, but anyway, so I did well with Kenny. Did two tours with him, um, and then I picked up some local work with Smash or regional work with Smash Mouth, where they're doing Weekend Warrior because I wanted to play. Man, I, I was playing a lot of bands. I was doing well in Austin as a drummer, uh, and the sa- Smash Mouth supplemented my income. But then, man, just Things needed to change in my life. I felt it. And I reached out about a gig I thought I had lost, which was Joss Stone, Mm -hmm. uh, and got it. (laughs) I thought I didn't get it, and then I get the gig, and, you know, two weeks later, I'm doing Live 8 in London. (laughs) Hanging out between Sting and Michael Stipe, talking to Elton John about the ensuing day. (laughs) You know? And I'm like... Wild. Yeah. Once that happened, bro, I'm like, bro, English English and Scottish uh, music festivals, bro. That's what the dreams of rock and roll are made of. They're the best, dude. <laughs> You're backstage at this little, you know, cantina area with massages and tattoo artists and <laughs> jugglers. I mean, the backstage area is so much fun. It's like its own carnival and it's its own family. Uh, and you're sitting there having, you know, a beer at the bar with Tom Jones, mm, you know? And you're right. like, okay, <laughs> this, is, this is my Saturday afternoon. Cool, cool. Oh, look, it's Annie Lennox. This is awesome, <laughs> you know? And so you get in that situation, you start realizing, hey, man, you know, the universe is pushing me this way. And all of a sudden, my, my career went like, boom. Mm. And then I decided I'm taking a break and um, went back to playing. And then the universe spoke again and a flood came to Texas, took like all my lake work away for the week, for the, for the summer. It was like all gone, all my money gone. Mm. And I was like, oh, well, looks like I'm teching again. Put out the wow. call, and I started with Stevie Wonder, and I've just said, "Look, Universe, you got me. I'm going. I'm rolling." And just started rolling after that, and and it became what it became, man. Blessed, uh, blessed. That's all I, I mean, can say. Blessed, I, I, man. It's funny. I, I I hear you, but you you you're obviously good, like very good, because you don't get to be on big tours like Stevie Wonder if you can't hang, right? No, no. I mean, look, there's a lot of techs out there like don't know how to tune a drum, but they're best mm. friends with the drummer or they do the hang well. They can handle the equipment and they're okay under pressure, you know, so they got the gig mm. um, for what it pays. And they're great guys, great techs, and they do the gig. But when you start getting to those upper gigs, I learned quickly, especially in pop world, you need to know, you need to know your business or be able to pull off the poker face when they go, so you can program this and you go, yeah, sure, man. And then have the <laughs> manual like right behind your back on like this little mirror and so, say, yeah, it's yeah. this. Oh, there it is. <laughs> right. right there. That's what you're looking for. And then when you, you know, get them happy for a minute, dive in the corner and read in the dark. You have to be able to read in the dark and get your skills up fast because some things move fast and there's no, there's usually no, in a sense, second chance unless you've been experienced. Uh, it's, it's go time. I remember, I remember I was doing keys on Rihanna and uh, it was my third tour with her and I'd moved over keys just to expand my horizons and my guru would come back and, and was doing the drum tech gig and we were bros. So I was like, yeah, the mm. keys, you do drums. It was <laughs> awesome. And the night before the first set of rehearsals, uh, I get to the stage and this, there was this hole that was supposed to be the front keyboard riser and it went up and down through the stage, right? And went really high, la, 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 la. At some point in time, Pete, the keyboard player, and Nuno Betancourt had to both oh, okay. be on that playing while it went, you know, 10 feet in the air. So it had to be safe, had to have room for his keyboard rigs. And that keyboard rig had to be able to be broken down in under a minute. So for the fifth act of the show, the stage could come back and be there for dancers. Right? Awesome, right? The best. (laughs) 
<laughs> so I had the plan, had everything going. I get there, and the stage cut out is like four inches smaller all the way around, man. Oh, so no. nothing I did worked. And we rehearsing tomorrow. Yo, oh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so I had to integrate a front keyboard controller system along with a Jupiter 8 and a laptop system that was not only breakdownable, but basically I had no sound generator. So I ran that through MIDI up to the top keyboard system and learned how to program all the keyboards to talk to each other and run patch changes off Pro Tools and get it done before 10 a.m., bro. It was 9.30 when I, at p.m. at night when I saw that floor. Jesus. <laughs> Man, okay, so like I've I've got a bunch of questions that I've written down, but I think <laughs> I'm probably gonna like unpack off your answers because like where like where do you even start, right? You so and you're talking about an instrument that you might not necessarily have been all that familiar with. Certainly not as familiar with that as you are with the drum set. No, no, but you know, because of drum set, I studied MIDI and MIDI programming. I understood mm -hmm. trigger programming. And so right. you realize that Roland and Yamaha have similar programming structures. They're like a mm -hmm. Windows and a Mac. They have a way of organizing their folders. And um, repetitive uh, concepts in terms of, like, how MIDI works or how programming works, you know. And so once you get inside the menus, you have to use some intuition uh, and then realize that, hey, man, you know, there's, there's rabbit holes. Go down them. Get in there. Mm. Uh, and I think that's the key to it, man. You know, finding the MIDI programming structure, like the MIDI map in, in a sense, the MIDI grid that's inside the Roland uh, Phantom keyboards and learning how to layer it and shut off certain parts that they said, oh, that'll work, and it didn't work. Mm. And you're like, but Roland says it works. It doesn't work, bro. Mm. So you have to go in deeper and make it yeah, work right. yeah. by 10 a.m. <laughs> and so, so that's part of what makes <laughs> teching important, you know, and also having, I mean, just, Courage, man. Like we're all we're all human, man. If we don't know what we're doing about something, it's hard to be confident, right? Of course. Well, you know, your artist is in there in front of, you know, ten, fifteen thousand people wailing and something goes wrong, man. Confidence is no longer high with your no. drummer, you no. know what I mean? No. And you have to be that person that has the courage to get in there and fix it like it ain't nothing. You know what I mean? Uh, one of the highest compliments I could have gotten was on my last tour of the December. Is the lighting guy, who's normally the grisly guy, uh, paid me a compliment by, by saying, hey, Kenny, you know what? I, I love how you walk on stage like you're meant to be there. Fix the issue and walk off, man. So many people run off crazy. And I'm like, no, bro. You can't run out there crazy. You freak your artist out. They might punch you. They might think it's an attacker and be like, Pow! And you're like, I just brought you water, so why did he punch me? It's water. Because you ran out there like a stalker. <laughs> you know, and you have to think about these environmental situations to prepare yourself for the moment. Because, again, it's about your drummer's mind and, and his or her ability to connect with and guide the band. They all work together, especially if they're working for an artist and the artist has needs. And mm. especially someone like Rihanna or Janet, you out there, it's you. Mm. You dancing, you you moving, you singing, you just, it's you. And so when you mess with that environment, you messing with their money, and no, you want to do that, yeah. dude. Don't do no, it. No, it, it, it seems like you have a sort of holistic understanding of all of it. Yeah, we ain't got to... fear causes fear, man. Confidence mm. begets confidence. Mm. Uh, my drummer with Josh Stone, we were playing uh, 2005 Fashion Rocks, and one of the other techs missed. He didn't realize it was go time, and we rolled on for TV. We're live TV, man. We're on in like two mm. minutes, you know? Three minutes. Okay, it was maybe like a three-minute ad thing. So we get all the gear in position, and I'm getting my drums plugged in. They're plugging the mics. I'm line-checking drums while telling them how to plug up the amps over there because my guy's not there. Jesus. Um, and, and he would, like, done something for the artist and came back. I was like, oh, my God. He came running in at the last minute. Got it. Got a little on, but I'm doing line check. And I look. I'm like, snare one, snare one, snare two. And I'm just telling them while I'm hitting drums, not thinking, right? Well, I didn't realize the monitor engineer had brought the in-ears and put them on snare, too. So when I looked down and saw these Lego pieces, I was like, what's with the, oh, my God! I had smashed oh, one of my drummer's ears straight shit. up, man. Straight up. Um, and, it, again, it was a situation where I, I told the drummer, and I told the, star, the monitor guy, don't do that. I told them several times, please don't do that. They did it anyways. Boom, man, ear gone. And, we're, and now he's walking up all ready to rock, and I'm like, Oh, well, this is something to spin. Here we go. All right. <laughs> my my non-molded ones, which will fall out of your ears, but have triple drivers and sound great, or just one of your molded badass triple drivers. And he was, must have, I was like, ah, 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 ah. you ain't got time to cry about it. 
you got 30 seconds. We on fire. You playing or not? And he goes, I want the one. Boom. Got him up there. Got him ready. Had his back. Put his mind on the game. And he slaughtered the set, dude. Jesus. And afterwards, you know, and he could have gone, that could have gone downhill instantly. Mm. You have six seconds in front of 60,000 or possibly six million watching on TV to fix it. Or you could be fired. Mm. And the show sucks. And nobody wants that. It's not just <sighs> being fired. You don't want anybody to suck on TV. Then all of a sudden, everyone's on YouTube going, yo, did you see that drama crash and burn? And you're like, yeah, I was the guy who fucked it up. And you just head down, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, I don't want that. No. So so you no. have to think, uh, I think the best thing I came up with, and I was honored when, when Kenny Aronoff repeated it, but I, he said, what do you like working best about me? He said, you make me proactively reactive. You make me go the extra step ahead of time to predict what could go wrong and be ready for it, to have everything in place so my reaction time is not freaking. You aren't freaking. And it's the same thing if you're playing a drummer playing a gig, you know what I mean? A drummer playing a gig, you want to be ready for the gig. You mm -hmm. want to be prepared ahead of time. You want the charts. So if somebody does throw a curveball, you're all, uh-huh, cool, because mm -hmm. you're ready for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's kind of what makes you a good tech is being able to predict what can go wrong, be prepared for it, and make it happen. Have you always been into gear like that? Like nitty gritty, like no, tension rod no, thread man. sizes? And, I don't no? care. I don't okay. care. <laughs> <laughs> right. As terrible as it sounds per se, I don't geek out about that. What I geek about is the sound it can make. You know, like I mm. love the fact that DW has specialized threads. You can get really intricate with the tuning. But there are faults to that, like it takes forever to finger tighten them. And if you Based go low, right? Jesus. yeah, oh my God, oh my God. But, you know, it, they do have the ability to hold tight, but at low tunings, they can back out really easily, where if it's a thicker thread, they might get some torque and tension going on a little bit sooner. Mm. Now, that's what excites me, like the <sighs> sciences behind it and the physics of it and doing what it takes to work with the air. Because, like, my time with Stevie Wonder, I was so blessed to work with the engineers, uh, I, I just thinking on it, Dwayne, Bill, um, Danny, Leek. These are guys that were like, if it was back in the day, they'd be wearing lab coats because they're engineers. Right. Uh, and what they could do with sound waves and sound um, is amazing. I remember seeing having Dwayne be the, like the most amazing monitor engineer. I'm like, he makes it so good. He goes, really? Check out Bill's. And he hands me Bill's. And I literally started drooling. <laughs> like drool just came out my mouth. And then I went and saw Dwayne mix Drake out front. <laughs> Next level. <laughs> Next level, dude. It was like going to the who. The sound was moving through you and it wasn't loud. And I was like, dude, it's like super loud, but not loud. He goes, I know, man. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it's about preparing the sounds for that cat, for that lady. Like when I was with Michelle uh, 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 Sablacek, um, uh, Pedonato. Uh, yeah. with Elvis Costello, I, right. I was honored to prepare for her the sounds because mm -hmm. of what she was about to do with them. She was about to join up, bro. Mm -hmm. And so that's mm -hmm. what I get into. And watching my drummers smile <laughs> and watching them play the heck out of the kit and get the juice and be like, right, right? Okay, cool. Yeah, right. Because it ain't about me. No. I, I'm like the lowest guy in the totem pole. And that's anyone who wants to be a drum tech, I'm going to tell you, get ready to be last in line. Bring tacos, or if you're in, in the UK, bring tea <laughs> just bring your bro a cup of tea and you'll be the best dude ever and same with tacos in texas bring breakfast tacos everybody loves the guy who brings breakfast tacos because otherwise your job is to get out of the way man it's just the truth yeah. Yeah. in the morning it's not your time get out of the way can we start setting our drums not yet get out of the way yeah. all right get your drum set up man would you get out of the way we got to yeah. put more lights up okay and then nighttime comes and it's slowed out bro you can't even say the words get out of the way because it, it, you would have wasted time. Uh. That's, you wasted too much time saying get out and just get yeah. out of the way. Yeah. You know, and so it takes a mentality to be that person because you're about service to others, you know. But hey, man, you know, ask all the questions because I could tell stories. No, I, I, for days. I will. Absolutely, I will. I will. Um, but it's like, there's just like onslaught of information that's like, shit, I've got, you know, my brain goes like, well, well let's go this way. Let's go this way. And then there's no thread, but. Um, we don't need a thread. We just need drums. <laughs> your method, your two keys cross and cross. Like, was that, did that, how did that come around, man? How did you develop something where you have that sort of level of detail <laughs> on just how to tune a drum quickly? Well, I mean, you know, there's more, the, the cross cross method uh, is to me, uh, unfortunately, it, it just 
it's evolution. It's what is how it's supposed to be done. You right. know, and so I'm sitting there uh, in high school playing snare drum in the line. I get there a little late to, you know, dress review where the, you know, you, they check your uniform, they check your snare, everything ready, you know, inspection. Uh, and my head popped. And I'm sitting there oh, in line dressed, ready to go, and my head just blasted to blap. And you're like, oh. Shit. So I had to change that head before they got to me, yo. And I used my two keys and I blazed through it so fast. And as I did it, I could feel the physics at work. So I just started doing it like that. And after that, man, I mean, it's, you could do something or you could just get it done, you right. know, and, and it became a matter of getting done with Aaron off on the road. You're changing his drum heads every show, mm-hmm. every show, the full kit top, mm-hmm. at least tops, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and that's Is a lot it just of work. Because on- he's hitting them so hard though. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we split, we did it. We had him in clinic maybe about 10 years ago. And he, he hit the snare drum so hard that the stick snapped and flew across the room and nearly hit one of his in the eye. Pretty oh, amazing. great. Yeah. It's like, pretty amazing. You know? Yeah, well, we're now a team. We're a club. Right. We're a very exclusive club. Those who almost got blinded by a stick <laughs> by Ed Kenny yeah. Dude, he hit so hard. But it, it's funny because uh, I'll tell it in a two-part story. It's this. Right. While I was out with him on my first tour, I always pride myself on being ready, right? And I didn't have in-ears uh, at the time, but I heard the snare pitch change way too much in one snap. I was like, he just broke his hoop. And he was using that air ride system, so it was possible to break it. It's hard to see hit, right? And so I said, no problem. And I was there with the snare in under 20 seconds. We had it switched out, done, gun, boom, right? And I put the head on and I tuned it. You can't hear nothing, no tune about nothing, but I got it right, knew what I was doing, ready. The system helped me get there. Mm, right. Um, and I stood up already. I got your backup ready. He looks at me, goes, good. And I already knew what good meant because I'd heard the pitch drop again because I just broke this hoop. Bro, two hoops in one, like, set, like, within two songs of each other. Insane. Die cast? Insane. Die cast. Gone. Wow. <laughs> but it brings me to the other half where I remember telling that story to a drummer who was all, he was in the hot band in Austin. He just thought they were the next thing. So we just couldn't talk enough about how much he hated everybody else and loved himself, right? And he started talking about technique. He was, he was a jazz guy from UT. I love jazz guys, but not this one. And he said, he said, he said, uh, man, I'm just breaking hoops and cymbals, man. Well, it must be awful technique. That must be. And I was like, bro, it's Kenny Aronoff. He has so much technique to do that. You don't understand the amount of training and dedication this guy gives to the craft of smashing a drum. Well, a- anybody that does any research, he's a classical percussionist and has been forever. So he's got yeah. like the best technique. Right? Everything's form, man. Yeah. Everything's form. And I, I studied him and I guarantee you all the lessons I kept with him kept me without tendonitis, without mm. tennis elbow, without shoulder problems, anything all my life until, of course, I had a... A biking accident. Now I got wrist problems, <laughs> tail problems, and shoulder. Beautiful. <laughs> that's nice. <that's... laughs> but Kenny, you know, again, man, when you're in the arena with the dog, I mean, he's the king, one of the king dogs, man. You just mm. you begin to understand what it is to be that person for somebody. And it, the goal is to me with my channel, and definitely with my website, where the lessons I give are step by step, and also help support my YouTube channel. Mm. And I got a really well priced, like super cheap. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's about helping you tech for yourself. It's about mm-hmm. putting yourself in a position to where you're not going, well, how do I, my drums are out of tune? What do I do? They mm-hmm. don't go out of tune that often. Mm-hmm. Like with Aronoff, he would dent the crud out of his head. So I mean, take them out and they'd be canyons, right? Mm-hmm. But I had prepped them and stretched them enough that they were still in pitch. Mm-hmm. Holla. Yeah, yeah. Head's dead, but they sounded great and still in pitch. Right. Now, if he had done two shows with that head, it would have been terrible. Halfway through the, the first set, uh, or halfway through the set, they would have been mush and been all round. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, right. But out of the, straight out of the box, they sounded good for a minute. You know, so, because <laughs> how you prepare the drum and how you put the head on really makes a difference. How you stretch the head makes a difference. Mm-hmm. How you approach that. And that's where the, the techniques got refined uh, in terms of like the, the cross cross, because you're, you're pressing a head down. Mm-hmm. You're not you're not wobbling it around. When you wobble mm-hmm. it around, you're pulling the center back and forth, back and forth. But if you press it together, now you have two points of tension that you're working off of, and that allows you to have a much more uh, balanced approach to your tuning. Because once you t- 
I'm telling you, man, watch one of my videos, just stream it and help my channel, or book a lesson with me. I do online lessons. Oh, for the yeah, same. yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that later. We'll, talk, we'll let yeah. Paul know where to find it stuff, because I, I have been watching some of them, you know, and it's um, it's pretty hip. You know, like, we, we've been selling drums for nearly two decades now, and, and people come in for us to... To have the drum set, their set heads changed, and let's tune them up, and we'll tune the yeah, same baby. drum. Um, but it's like you you think you you kind of know what's going on, and then I watch something like you, and I'm like, fuck, I have no clue what's going on. You know, like there's, there's, just, <laughs> there's like like you talk about there's levels to playing. Well, there's levels to this stuff too, right? Because your ex your experience is like you've had twenty years of teching experience on top of all the playing. Yeah, and on top of like different experiences, uh, mm. like I had to go into the um. What was it? Uh, the voice. Voice. Right, yeah, TV's, yeah. TV's very challenging. Mm. Uh, and I did the voice with Rihanna. And I went in there with one of those bass drum heads where it had that funky hole in the middle. Mm. But that's what the person who did the logo, the big R logo on the head, decided it was where they're going to put the hole. We'll just do it here. I'm like, oh, yeah. thank you for choosing for me. Thanks that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right? But we yeah. were out the door. She head showed up. I put it on the drum. We got on a plane for 777, which was seven shows in seven countries in seven days with Rihanna. On a 777 with 177 press people, it was the best, right? So I get back, we're doing the voice, and I didn't have time to change the head, but it was also the logo for the tour, yo. It was her, yeah. it was her icon for the moment, uh, yeah, her way of representing it. her thing. So I'm not taking that off the head, and the guy was all, oh, could you change that bass drum head? And I'm like, you haven't even heard it, bro. Mm. And so the, the ensuing thing was, after he heard all my drums, he goes, hey, man, can we do this again? He wants to clear his board and start with fresh EQ because he doesn't normally have a kit in here that's right. And Because TV's hard, man. It's hard. Mm. And so you got to be prepared to be the best of the best under those mics. So when you go live, those skills transfer over. You know. So th do you have like separate compartments in your brain, like festival, shed, arena, TV, where you just have different tuning methodologies or whatever yes and no i mean do you know i tune for my artists the same in every room in every house in every right. place if that's okay. the way they want it that's the way it is right? right then it's up to me to adapt it like we went and, when i was with train and we did howard stern mm -hmm. uh i brought a good set of rods for him um uh, uh what was it vic firf root mm -hmm. but also he wanted to play one of the songs with sticks because they were doing zeppelin right so i used oh, my yeah, tape right. tent system on the drums and on the cymbals Mm. Uh, like I, I not only did I put tape tents on top of the drum for the warmth, but then I put them in between two tension rods underneath a double tent to really just do the drum mm. in the studio. And while it might not have been the ideal sound for recording <laughs> in Howard Stern's room, it was perfect. Mm. And if it had drum had not been tuned right to a major third instead of a perfect fourth in that room, wouldn't have worked. Right. That one half step made all the difference in how the the room read the drum and the drum read the room or responded to the room. So do, do, do you know when you walk into a room what the interval should be? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, again, some of it's experiential, man. I, I had the blessing of doing a whole bunch of uh, English theaters and American theaters back to back with Elvis Costello. Mm -hmm. and taking care of Pete, who I love. He's just the mm -hmm. best, man. What a guy. Smashing player. Great. Smashing player, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just, you go back yeah. to his parts that everything he did was so cool. It was it, not even just monstrous chops, just cool. Yeah. And it, it, with his bass drum, a lot of times if we had a short hall that was tall, like a short theater that's all, you know, oh, we have boxes going up the wall for royalty. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> right? That's where the royals watch the show. Yeah, with yeah. all us common people down below yeah. in the rabs, where all the rats are in the dirty the trenches. Yeah, the rabble where you're like, the bars are certainly nicer upstairs. <laughs> no cues for, the, for those lot. Why do they have giant hoses strapped to the wall? And then you realize it's to wash you and the floor off at the end of the night. But those short halls, take a different bass drum tuning than say longer halls. Like with longer halls, I can take the bass, his bass drum head and tune it up a whole step above the pitch of his batter head and it, it's punch central, big and boomy punch central. But when I did it in the short halls, it created this powerful slap back. And oh, okay. I was like, wow, just off the bass drum? But yeah, just off the bass drum, bro. So I flipped the interval and tuned the top, the batter head or the rezo head lower 
Then the batter had an instantly big fat pillow, and it loved it in the shallower rooms. But when you went to the longer rooms, it didn't have the throw they needed for the mic to respond to it in the room. And so I tuned back and forth, and we always laughed. That's why I enjoyed working with Michelle, because she was like, totally a difference. And she wasn't, <laughs> she wasn't lying to me. She was like, thank you. I can now go to lunch. You know? Because right. <laughs> we want lunch, bro. Absolutely, I right. I don't want to spend my whole day tuning a four-piece cat. Come on. No. <laughs> no one wants to spend their day doing that. No one's one. Um, give me a day in the life on tour. A day in the life on tour, man. Uh, you know, again, it depends on the act, and it okay. depends on the situation. I'll, I'll give you the two situations here that I just did, because I did Dead & Co's summer tour, which included stadiums. Mm-hmm. And then I did this awesome run with the Decemberists through some smaller mm-hmm. um, sheds, like outdoor sheds. They did a lot of sheds, some theaters, clubs, mm-hmm. uh, and Central Park in New York, man. It was an awesome tour, right? Mm-hmm. So on something like that, where it's more ground, like grassroots, you're more in the touring flow. It's three on, one off, three on, one off. You going, man. We making the cash and out. Uh, it's, a, it's a throw and go, and you're the act. So you load in about, you up at like 839, just so you can watch your buddies with lights load in while you eat maybe a bagel next to them. Just going, I thought you wish you had a bagel. <laughs> Knowing that you had a bagel for them the whole time. So when they're done sweating, they turn around, they're like, you got me a bagel? And tea if they're English. And they're like, yeah, man. And then you go, all right, truck's yours. And you go, cool. And you throw your bagel plate in the trash. And then you start unloading your stuff and get it laid out. But everything you do is based upon what somebody did before you. You need to be out of the way for the staging, out of the way for the lighting, out of the way for all that stuff. Um, And with the Decemberists, I'm building the stage. On that gig, I'm building my own little riser. Not the stage, but my own risers. Uh, then you plop your gear up, get it all ready, get it all plugged in, make sure you're ready for line check. With, with the December, it was about 2 o'clock. Right. So I usually had time just in time from getting load in at 10, getting all set up because I did keys and drums, getting everything tuned and ready. Uh, I'd have time for a good lunch mm-hmm. and then head back up for line check at 1 or 2, uh, knock that out, and then you got usually about 45 minutes before the artist comes. Right. And they would do their sound check, uh, and then they do their uh, meet and greet, which was awesome. They do a they perform for the people, do question Q and A, meet and greet. It was awesome, great way to do a COVID meet and greet. Um, and then once that's done, I fine tune everything, and then I go do some yoga, bro. Right, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Usually, cool. some people will grab a nap, they'll grab a video game, they'll grab whatever just to clear yourself out, mm-hmm. you know, for the incoming show. Because once it's six thirty and you've had dinner and stuff. It's time to get it on. Doesn't matter what time you're going on. You need to go in show mode. And then it's one, two, three. And you all of a sudden, you're like, wow, we're doing a show. Mm-hmm. And you're on. So it's, it's a very pointed day that has flow with a little break in the middle, if you're lucky. Mm-hmm. Now, with the dead, <laughs> oof. so the dead, I go in early just to make sure when the risers are ready that we can start dumping. Because me and Nick, we got a semi. An right. entire semi. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> And I have to wait for the staging to be railed, lights up, uh, or basic lights up, video rig up, all the truss up and built. I have to wait for audio to be hung and all this stuff before I even get in. So if I see the stage before 11 o'clock or 1, or 11 o'clock or 12, I am lucky. So I get my yoga and all my business done in the morning. Then once I'm in at 11, that's it. I am on that stage until 1 in the morning when I load out. If I get if I get dinner, I'm lucky. I got to build that whole back wall, that whole giant drum set, help John build uh, Ramu and uh, the guitar, the giant guitar, the beam. Yes. Uh, we build that in conjunction, man. And we take care of each other and blast it up. And we find our time during the day. But with Mickey, man, it's best to go ahead and monitor the rig. It's really? just, just do it, man. Make sure everything is within one inch. Like, like nothing is off. Because mm-hmm. he'll have 150 drums up there and he will notice the one that's off. And as soon as that happens you run the risk of him thinking that you might not be paying attention. I don't want to put that in Mickey's head. I want him focusing on creating greatness because if you do that, Mickey creates magic. So Mm -hmm. my whole goal during the day is create the palette for him to create magic. Yeah, that sounds like the details, the devil's really in the details. I remember we had our saw clinic with Dave Weckl and um, I know the guy who teched for him on that tour. And um, <clears throat> he was setting up in a particular gig, a uh, particular venue, and Weckl's doing his thing, he's playing, 
And he's like, did you change something with the 16? He's like, no, man, no, like, what's up? He's like, it just, I don't know, just the 16 just feels different. And it worked out that the, 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 the floor tom foot was on a carpet joint. And it had lifted just enough for Dave to notice. So you're just like, okay, so now we're having to make sure, you know, and you're probably still working with things like it's got to look good out at the front too. So if you if you move it, it's going to not look like it did look when it looked. Do you know what I mean? There's so much in the way of detail. Well, there is in detail. Like in certain things, I mean, once lights are focused, lights are focused, bro. Mm-hmm. And you you got it, so you have to be considerate of the person. But those are the things you have to look out for. Mm. Uh, Aaron Office is a fine example, and it would be the same with someone like Weckle. You know, they aren't just playing the drums, bro. They are masters. Yeah, right. They, yeah, they like, masters. Bro. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was in San Francisco or San Diego, my last gig, street scene, last gig with Melissa on the tour, and the riser was about two inches, maybe four inches shy of of a full eight by eight. So in order to make it fit, I had just kind of just kind of made it, everything was fit and maybe it was just a micron off right well, yeah bro first fill he went for that's when i almost got stick in, hit in the eye with a stick by kenny aronoff because it shot straight out of his hand he was like what the and it, he goes around for the next one and it hit it again and yo it was the only time the only time i ever heard it from kenny you know he's the best he's so kind and constructive in his criticism and and uh and he wants you to win because if you win, he mm-hmm. wins. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, so, <laughs> but bro, no words for the words. So really? I figured out how to, and literally on the spot, built an extension on there to where by the end of the song, I could move the rack out the extra two and a half, four inches it needed, whatever it was. Oh, man. I'll never, do, I'll just build it ahead of time now. <laughs> Yeah. See, you learn. You learn. I was daydreaming. I was lost. I was like, oh. But it's interesting because it strikes like there's so much of it you don't know. It's like you don't know what you don't know, right? Man, you don't know what you don't know, bro. So if you are if you don't know that a venue till you get there and realize it's not going to work, then you, you can't prep for that ahead of time because you don't know. Well, to some degree, yes. But, you know, our job is to know what they, they don't know. Right. Uh, to know what we're not supposed to know. I mean, classic Mickey is is one of his fa- my favorite things about Mickey is he'll come up with an idea and I'll be like, "That's great, good, let's make it happen." An hour later, I'll come back in. We gun. I'm like, Mickey, you just thought of it. Yeah, but you should have gotten these parts yesterday, knowing I was gonna think about this. Right. Yeah. And then he laughs and walks out the room. And I'm like, my man, my man, because <laughs> he's making a point. Be proactively reactive. Think ahead about what your artist is doing and how they flow flown and have mm-hmm. at least finger things at your fingertips. Mm-hmm. But in a lot of these rooms, you know, if the roof's short, you know, if this is going on, you know, that loading is not going to be right. You know that your riser is going to be a few inches closer to the thing, you know, so you prepare. Yeah. Like I did with, with the Howard Stern thing by putting the cymbal things on and the under tents on the drums. You know, we had Zeppelin at low volume mm. and my drummer could just play. Mm. It was mm-hmm. awesome. <laughs> Howard thought it was awesome too. Then you've really won, right? Yeah, as long as Howard Stern's happy, we're all happy, right? <laughs> if Howard Stern is happy, the world is at peace. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a much better place when he's happy. Um. So for you then, what is a good shell? What do you look for in a shell, drum shell? Like, what's a good shell? Oh, man. Okay, so here's the thing, man. Shell, um, quality construction is, is, is really what matters the most. I mean, mm-hmm. like, my Rogers kid here, my Covington's three-ply with two-ply rings. Come on, they sing <laughs> like a mad dog. And they're <laughs> sensitive. They're a little bit, the bass drums are a little bit rough to tune. They get challenged. They shift out on you because it's so flexible shell just like the Ludwig legacies are man mm-hmm. you know where you're it's three plies bro right yeah yeah but it's so good <laughs> and then if that's the sound you want but i just did a review on the rogers power tone kit which is the five ply with the two ring rings come on bro a little <laughs> bit more a little bit more impact a little bit more thickness to the tone mm-hmm. um and it made me so happy because that's the the others are like the old schools like 65 toms you know the old <laughs> holiday series and stuff those are the open rogers toms but you get into 71 where I think we get into the, uh, well, yeah, the power tone kits. Like 71 and 72, they were the thicker shell. And that was the stuff I truly fell in love with where you'd hear those power toms going around on 70s rock. And they were like, they have depth and they bite. That's what I want. 
So yeah. I'll go more for a five or six ply shell on that. Now you get into six ply shells with with things like uh, the old Ludwig's that were the six ply and four ply series that they went through the super classics and the classics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those six ply classics, bro. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. But again, as you get into thicker drums. The goal sometimes is to know that you can tune higher to get lower, thuddier pitches per se out of them because it's deeper tones out of the shells. So I just did a super thick with re ring Gretsch kit. I don't even know what kind it was uh, from back in the day over at Willie's studio, our old studio Arlen. Um, and I was, I, I thought I couldn't tune it lower, and then I did. And I was like, that's right. These are these <laughs> thick old Gretsch shells, big old thicky, thicky things. Um, but man, my favorite bearing edge out of all of them right now is the one that's on this. It's the Bill Detmore edge where it's a little bit more in, it's a, it's a rounded 45 and a rounded in, you know what I mean? Where you, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's yeah, not yeah. pointed. It's, it's got the pointed on inside, rounded on the outside yeah, yeah, right. and it's moved in a little bit more on the shell. And I like that best because to me that activates the shell and takes a, advantage of the warmth of the rounding of the outside, mm -hmm. but the, the definition of that cut. On the inside, and 90% and of the time, that's really what drummers are looking for, that sound. Mm -hmm. They want a thunder, <laughs> but they still want, you know, a, a good attack and stuff and tone. Do you find like a, a lot of guys don't actually know what they want or they don't know how to describe it? Yeah. 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 Uh, it, it's hard to explain. Like, I know so many drummers that get the sound they want. They love the sound of their drums, and that's cool. And then I'll come to a session for them. They're like, well, how do I get there? So I show them how to get to what they did by showing them where it should have been in the first place to achieve what you were going for. Mm -hmm. And so when I find that spot and then I tune it for them, then they hear their drum for the first time probably in their lives, really heard the drum. Yeah, yeah, right. It really changes their perspective on, you know, what it is they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and... It, it's not about knowing per se, it's just about knowing the basics and rolling with it. Like, I, I don't care what shell you give me. I'm gonna make that drum sound killer for the situation. Mm -hmm. But I also know that, you know, there's a big difference between this Rogers floor tom and like little John's Bobingo floor toms, mm -hmm. those tomas, mm -hmm. <gasps> thick fist. You know, yeah. rich, deep tone, thick fist of tone. <laughs> um, they're two different attacks, man. And yeah. It's a matter of choosing what it is you really look for. Because a lot of drummers know what they want. They just don't know how to get that, man. They right. don't know what it's going to give it to them. And to me, the first priority of any situation is learning how to tune the instrument right first. And then it allows you to you know, move into the next level of, well, what wood do I want? What metal do I want? What, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Because I've been playing my Dynasonics now for a little while, and I love them. Mm -hmm. I mean, dude, it was, it, uh, British Drum Company, Scott, mm -hmm their own version of it with the heartbeat, you know, suspension system. And it's, it's just, there's a certain sound of the snare. Mm -hmm. And I was yeah. doing all these gigs with the wood snare and everyone's like, that's amazing. That's incredible. I'm like, the wood snare is the only one. And then I got one of the brass super tens, six and a half, 14. Yeah. And I'm like, I miss a brass drum. And I can't play it enough, <laughs> bro. You know, right? My black beauty's in the corner going, what about me? It's like, <laughs> it is time. Don't look at me like that. You know, and then uh, GK Drums built me a custom walnut. We did some lesson trades and stuff, and, and I helped him learn better at his craft for tuning. And he built me this wonderful walnut drum. I brought it in the studio the other day, and the people flipped out. They were like, that drum's good, that drum, but what is that drum? Yeah. You know, and so again, it's, it's knowing that sometimes you need something different in your collection if you're in the studio or live, you know, mm -hmm. to create the sounds you want. And if you don't have, like, say you want a dark snare, but you don't have a walnut, but you have a wood, well, you might want a thicker single ply head yeah. or a thicker head, but tuned lower, mm -hmm. you know, then you would tune your normal things to get the deeper tone out of it. And sometimes it's just going down a half step is all you needed to do to wake the drum up. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to go too far out of your comfort playing zone to get those right. tones. So knowing how to tune your instrument or what heads to choose can go a long way to you using the same snare drum on every song that you do for the rest of your life. Right. <laughs> right. And then you can choose what shell you want. <laughs> so it sounds like drums have a, a sweet spot. You, you talk about waking a shell up. Do you think they have a point? Each drum has a point where it will sound the best it can? Again, best it can is relative, but right. yes, yeah. I think yeah, okay. uh, each drum has a range within which it's going to sound good. 
Now, yeah. I did a video recently and uh, saw a couple of people do a similar video and then also later do a video like the opposite of it, which makes sense. Uh, but it was my video was on how to tune small toms to sound big, uh, which is a lot of what I do in arenas, man. My drummers are playing 10, 12, 14. I'm like, oh, stop it. <laughs> I want this to sound like cannons, man. Oh, really? You do? Huh? That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> So I gotta find a way, and I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just playing, man. No, that's good, man. It's good because I've been that guy. That's what's funny about that. Yeah, uh, trying to make so, a 14 by 12 sound like an 18, just like I'll just go right, bro, right. <laughs> and you, and the, and the head's buried, hanging on, going, "Why did you buy me? Why did you buy me? Twenty other heads in the store. I could have gone to somebody who cared." Oh, that's great. Oh, I'm dying, man. I'm dying, but. But there is an art to it. And the reason I made the video is because, yo, you're one of those cats, bro. You got a 10, 14, you're, you're playing in pubs, right? Yeah. And you just got off work. You had enough time to, take, you know, to load your gear, take a quick shower before somebody stole your gear out of your car and then got to your gig. And you load it up and you set up. You had a quick pint and, and something to eat at the, at, the, at the pub. And then you're playing gigs, right? Until, right. you know, however many hours in the morning. And I'm seen some of the club stages in the pubs in the uk alone much less europe bro they mm -hmm. ain't room mm -mm. they ain't room mm -mm. you can't bring no 18 inch floor tom 26 inch kick and a 14 inch rack tom in there mm -mm. guitar player be sitting at the second table making waves you know but you need you need deep tones and so the yeah. concept was to make them sound sweet at these tunings and these are a couple of intervals that you could work with. And if you ease the drum up, you ease the drum up, you find it. Then you get into the middle range tunings where, man, a lot of these can really change the character of the drum. Like a medium tight tuning even or a medium type head with the top head, bottom head like really cranked. Two mm -hmm. entirely different sounds, man. Mm -hmm. But yeah, right. they activate that shell a little bit more. There's more attack going on. There's more um, pop to the drum than just doom. Now you got, where you get that bite and that attack. And then you get into the upper parts of a drum where sometimes you're like, well, it may not be the best place for it to be, but it's how my hands feel. And that's where, it's like in my art and craft, that's where I'll take the time to actually f invert the tuning. Uh, where I'll go, okay, well, normally I'd tune this like a, a major third, like this would be tonic, this would be a major third above, but since this drummer likes it super tight, I'll make the major third this way. Because mm. the drum sounds the same in terms of tone and pitch, or in terms of pitch, but the tone is entirely different. Mm. And it gives the drummer a chance to have some bottom end while still getting a <laughs> out of the top of their, you know, mm -hmm. tom head. Yeah. yeah. Um, vintage versus new. Well, I mean, it's hard to say, man. That vintage kid over at uh, Ireland Studio sounded amazing the other day. It, it, the floor tom was a bit of a challenge. Right. Uh, the bass drum was awesome and gave me a lot more bottom end at a higher tension than I thought I could, vintage. Mm -hmm. And then that the 13 was like cake. And then I had a vintage like Old Black Beauty that was a bit of a challenge. What, what, what were the shells? Were they uh, super classics or something? Um, the shells, I think, were on the... Well, the Ludwig was actually a snare drum, a Black Beauty. All right, okay. So um, what was the kit? The kit was a Gretsch. Oh, okay. And I just, it was, I think it was just plain old brown badge Gretsch from back in the day. Yeah. Uh, I forget sometimes like, you know, my models and stuff, because again, I, I, in a sense, I don't care. It doesn't matter what brand it is. If you put it in front of me, I got to make it sound good. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> you show up with the Gretsch Catalina for the tour, bro. That's what we're using, <laughs> man. That's what we're doing. That's what's happening. Okay. <laughs> you know? Amazing. No, but the, the, the sort of vintage versus new thing is a debate we have regularly because people ask us if you know do you sell vintage drums and we we don't really do that we don't really have the market for that but it's still a big thing in the industry well you know again like i talked to pete about this again he brought we were going to record in abbey studios and he brought his gretsch kit the mm -hmm. one that recorded all all the hits mm. why because it's the one mm, right and you don't get that often from a <laughs> modern sounding kit there's going to be certain mojo that comes with it. But at the same point in time, when I did my Rogers video on my most modern Covingtons and put them next to Jason Corbiari's 65 Covingtons, yeah, uh, he plays with uh, Jimmy Vaughn, Blues Legend Jimmy right. Vaughn, one of my faves. Uh, 
You couldn't tell the difference, bro. <laughs> mm. Mm. <laughs> because right. they they crafted the wood to sound different. And uh, man, I don't know if you've heard some of British drum companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, absolutely. But huh, I don't I don't know if I'd ever look at a vintage drum again. Yeah, you know, I, I, one of the, the when I I studied jazz music, and one of the, the things we we used to talk about was that if if you saw Elvin playing, and it, granted, it's the nature of when they were playing, but they were playing the best gear they could find, the most modern, up to date gear they could get they weren't playing on gear that was old and janky no they were they were the innovators yeah you know they were the first ones with the woodblock and the cymbal on the rail okay yeah right and it all evolved from that so all these drum companies were just hustling to make sure these cats do i mean buddy rich alone with what, what is it he was rogers then he was uh the other company slingland, slingland. was slingland yeah, yeah. look at some was, point yeah, just all these different companies battling for these drummers, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they were always playing the most modern drums, the most well-made drums, mm -hmm. per se. But really what makes a, a drum well-made to me is like the tension casings, the, the, the threads, the stuff right. you put on the shell. You yeah. can make a good shell sound great with great hardware. Uh, and you can also make a great shell sound pretty good with cheaper hardware. Mm. Uh, the first Thomas Swingstar, which is the first drum set I bought after my dad bought me this little weird Pearl knockoff uh, Taiwanese drum set. And it was just cheaper lugs on the Imperial Star shell. It was awesome. Mm, they yeah, sounded right. great. Yeah, yeah. But over time, those lugs aren't going to have the same uh, tone as higher quality lugs. And over time, they're going to crack and they're going to break because they're cheaper pop metal. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So for vintage drums, for me, it's a matter of looking at what you could do to make sure that drum stays alive. Like the old Rogers, a lot of times they were well-made lugs, but towards the 70s, they kind of got, mm. they were watching the budget and stuff, kind of got <laughs> cheaper in the pop metal. Yeah. So you get all this cracked crap, right? And can you re can you repair it? Can you replace it? Because mm -hmm. my one of my drum students, uh, Shane, he got an old vintage kit and uh, put all brand new lugs on it. That thing sounds so good. Mm. I don't care yeah. that one of the shells is just a hair but not around. Don't yeah. care. Yeah. It sounds so good. Yeah, so yeah, really, right. I think it depends on what you want. Like if you want to wear a, a cat that tails to the left and an arty jacket and swear to God that the gods of rock and roll are flowing through these drums that you <laughs> have in front of you, <laughs> that ancient Celtic rituals were performed <laughs> with these drums and therefore they expound upon you, their spiritual energy. Bro, vintage all day long. If you want people to go, he's legit. He's he's legit head to toe seventy eight. Go legit, man. Get get the, get the old kick at the old Ludwig's, because there's a sound there that you won't find anywhere else. But sure. I also know that I'll take an old Ludwig kit and a new Ludwig kit, put them right next to each other, and they'll sound the same. Right. I've done it with almost every brand of drums. Yeah, so. yeah I, I wasn't sure if you know the, the the kind of the idea of vintage was romantic. You know, like. Ringo played it, and therefore it, it must be great, you know. But the, the, what people forget a lot of the time was the way that re records were actually recorded. They were recorded very differently then than they were record than they were recorded now. Oh, totally. But uh, there is a lot of legitimacy in what you're saying. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I think Wood has spirit and personality. So if Ringo did play it, man, we're talking. Yeah, but if it was a if it was a Ludwig kit owned by a guy named Timmy, who <laughs> did, did a little too much meth. <laughs> um, and cranked stuff a little too hard and then stored it in his mom's closet while he went off to uni but didn't make it and then it just sat there all twisted and jacked like that, that's probably not going to have the same vintage vibe no. as a well-maintained kit, Point case in point. My keyboardist had two Leslie's out with us and one of them that we used most of the tour was amazing, but it had taken a little road wear and while I fixed everything, I was like, you know what, we have this other one. I want to see what it like. it sounds like. And she goes, yeah, that one was owned by Ben Montench. And I'm like, you've had one of Ben Montench's lessons <laughs> in here this whole time? Bro, I brought that out. It was like, ah, baseball game, Tom Petty. Baseball game, Tom Petty. Last five shows, Ben Mont ruled. We had Leslie and... She, Leslie took a break. Leslie and Leslie, she took a break for a little while. She worked hard, sounds so good. <laughs> But Ben Mont came in with that cigarette dripping from his lip, kind of a cool scarf on, and I was just smitten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's just next level. That's great.
Because it's true, man. Ben yeah. Montench played it. The wood knows what it's supposed to sound like. Yeah, and right. if you kept shoving great vibrations through that wood, the wood will know. And yeah. it'll sound that way. Dude, I got drums that Mickey's handed to me. Ancient ritual drums that have been through a lot. I've spoken a lot. And when they, You know it when you play in them, bro. Period. They touch you. They touch you inside your soul. So again, if, if it's about the vibe, get it. If it's about right. the sound, definitely get it. Yeah. Um, but also know that you might want to keep that vintage kit for your studio and for your projects and for your great music making and make sure you got a sturdy road kit that's going to last because a lot of times vintage will break down on the road. Yeah, right. But then I know drummers who had certain loves that they had and they didn't care that there was a dip in the hoop and they didn't care that it was a little beat up. It was the sound. Yeah, yeah. And so if that's what they want, let's do it. Um, okay, so you touched a little bit about it. You've touched on a little bit. Like, run us through problem solving because you, it sounds like 60%, 70% of your job is solving problems and solving problems now. First thing I'm going to ask is, do you think that is something that can be taught? Or do you think that you have to kind of have a mindset where, shit, I've got to solve this right now. You know what I mean? Man, problem solving is absolutely a skill from head right. to toe. Okay. For example, right now, I thought I had solved my problem with the notifications on my computer that keep popping off in my ear going dung, dung, mm. in the middle of this interview, right? I was really happy about it, but apparently I did not, okay? Right. <laughs> and so in my situation, I could go, well, this is a problem and come on over here and dick in the middle of this interview and go, oh, la, 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 we got it fixed, no more notifications. And it made me happy, but it didn't serve the situation. Right. And then sometimes you've got a problem solved by going, well, I'm gonna fix that tomorrow. And so you have to look into your mind and think about what the solution is. And then sometimes you have to fix it today. Mm. And so problem solving, again, is, is about looking at the situation with an open mind, but also looking at it for what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to reinvent the wheel just to, to put a wheel on. You know, you <laughs> yeah. don't want to. And really, I mean, sometimes like people are like, well, I want the drum to be open, but there's all this open resonance ringing when I, you know, do this <laughs> or my, you know, when I play. Well, okay, you're gonna need muffling. It's just the way it is. If you want that sound, a little bit of muffling will go a long way. And everyone will go, well, Danny Carey doesn't use any muffling. I'm like, well, one, Danny Carey plays very well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. If you're playing like Danny Carey, man, have it wide open, bro. But I, if Danny Carey was playing drums like that at your local pub, how would they sound? Yeah. Not so gnarly, good. man. Yeah. yeah. Gnarly, horrible. Yeah. But in a big open room with an engineer who can craft it and use comb filtering and special filters and all. Yeah, totally. You know, yeah. but at the local pub, no. Yeah. Uh, but within that context, you know, um, problem solving comes from looking at the situation and, and, and ha using your tools in a constructive way to follow a path. I think it's about path following. You know, you have to, you can't just randomly tear at something. The goal is to have constructive thinking. Uh, I had a pedal board go bad on... Um, Elvis Costello, but it wasn't a pedal board per se. It was actually a capacitor within the organ that was failing once in a while on a rare occasion. Vintage. <laughs> yeah, right. It's about that sound, right? Well, yeah. Uh, and, and we'll get into that a little bit more in one sec at the end of this because that was my point. You had the, the, the Vox Continental, there's only one sound, but there's also about 20 plugins that sound just as good. Yeah. yeah. You know, and plugins tour a lot better. Yeah. than a Vox Continental <laughs> does, you know? And that's all I have to say about that. But within the result of touring with a Vox Continental Vintage, a capacitor that is unfixable on the road uh, was going out. And so it made this sound, which normally is a bad, like a dirty cable. It usually means you just got a deox or something is a little loose. You got to tighten a jack. And it wasn't any of that. And the way I was able to figure out what was going on was basically to go through each one in an orderly fashion, knowing that this won't happen if this is going on. This won't happen if this is going on. So you have to choose the right path. You, and once you realize that if you pulled one cable out and the sound keeps going, you don't really need to go through every cable. You know, if you pull it out and you still hear, nothing you talk about or look at on your pedal board has anything to do with the problem. And that's how I was able to go, I was like, I went into it, I was like, wait a minute, you gotta touch it. And I just checked every pedal quickly and I was like, wait a minute. And I pulled the cable. And then, you know, I said, unmute. Well, mute to pull the cable, then unmute, and you heard it. 
so because it was coming from the direct out and you're like all right it's it's still it's still going on man you know because i just went direct to by the way pull the cable pull it direct into the keyboard so it's just straight no pedal board there we go that makes much more sense i'm in my own tech world going well you know you put the a thermometer to the b thermometer fuck anyways the point being is i went direct with the signal and the sound was still there. So it kept me from spending 10 minutes before a show freaking out <laughs> over my pedal board. And everyone kept going, man, it's your pedal board, it's your pedal board, it's your pedal board. I'm like, bro, you're so wise. You're right. <laughs> so unbelievable. And then I literally had only one choice of the situation. I fonzied the Continental. Just, ka -ka! Oh, yeah. Pat Done. Made it, made it through the like, next five shows before I heard it again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But there's like a common sense approach that you've got that I don't know is always teachable. Well, it is because you just have to sometimes get out of your own way. And, right. and that's the goal. Get out of your own way. The best advice I could give to any drummer or every tech trying to do what you want to do is no, believe in yourself. Be confident. Be knowledgeable and proud of your skills. But don't be afraid to step outside the box and go, wait a minute, I don't know everything because I don't know anything. Right, yeah. Okay, and I've been doing this for 22 years and there's so much stuff I don't know that I'm not going to start commenting on how to mix something better or this or that. It's not my know what you know and then take it outside of context and try to troubleshoot in the best ways because if you rely solely upon your own knowledge to be your source, a lot of times you grind down in the problem and you don't find a solution. Mm. Uh, but if you can stay light on your feet and think of possible options without it totally destroying your psyche <laughs> for doing so, <laughs> Um, well, now I don't believe in myself and you're in therapy f tripping about it or something. <laughs> I don't know. But it, you want to find that path that best serves the situation. I think that's the goal to look at what could best serve the situation. Mm. Uh, and it, it, it's, again, it's about choices with where your mind goes. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like I used to let stuff bug me in a major way and I, I'd be sitting there acting like I was cool. I wasn't cool at all in my ear. Yeah. And over time, I learned just let the the voice is going to come to the party you can't stop it but make sure it has a seat over there and you pay attention to what you got to pay attention to because the problem is in front of you a fine example on the decemberist we had a situation where um we had a power amp running my thumper that it was giving off some kind of charge because no matter what we did we isolated it from the sound system we isolated it onto the lighting grid so it had nothing to do with the sound ran its own independent signal, wasn't even going through it. We, did, we unplugged it completely, no audio going to it, but when you would kick it, it would cause a rack of DIs to have a little electrostatic charge, electrostatic charge, electrostatic charge. When we got rid of it and used the power amp at the rack, electrostatic charge, gone, mm -hmm. gone, dude, never happened again. And there's no words. It, something like that shouldn't happen, but that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And I could have gone to the guitar tech and gone, no, it's it's your power. It's yours. You clean them and tighten them. And we did. We got together. And I'm like, come on, let's clean them up. Make sure it ain't that. And we did it together. Mate. And they never sounded better, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not what it was. There was something mm -hmm. wrong with that power amp. It was close to the amp. And it was causing some weird electrical activity, which was not good. So, And there was no solution for it, but use this other power amp. Yeah. And yeah. it went away. So you mentioned that you've been doing this for 22 years. <laughs> what's changed in the industry or with how people oh, use man. gear or what, what from when you started to now what's changed well from when i started to now there the, like where i started was the precipice of what we are now uh right. keyboards were happening but keyboard tro controllers were starting to come in and while software systems weren't quite on tap in 2002 by 2012 i was using all laptop keyboard systems right as well as, you know, core, bad to the bone Korg and bad to the bone rolling keyboards, but still there were soft synths going on, especially with the main stage craze that was happening uh, during that time when main stage came out. All the keyboards were like, I can organize everything. Mm. Uh, and same with some of the drum programming. But really, I just see things getting better um, in oh, terms of like equipment, mm -hmm. in terms of vibe, in terms of attitude. But what I find is a drum tech common more than ever before is Ableton. Ableton, 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 and I uh, think I don't know how to use it. All right. But triggering with Ableton, creating uh, sculpted shows with an Ableton to where in Ableton, it turns the trigger on and off. So if you bump the snare in between, 
it doesn't make the trigger sound. You know, if you could do your ghost strokes, but you better be on point when that filter opens, you know, and creating systems and feedback, uh, like effect systems within the laptop that then you just send to your guy. No longer, I, I've seen a lot more of that uh, going on, or at least the signal you're sending when it comes to your triggering uh, is getting a lot of Ableton processing and a lot more creativity for the drummer to be able to actually uh, create music on the spot. That's what's killer about Mickey's rig is that with Ableton, he's using random tone generators on a lot of his drum patterns. So while it's a drum theme, like he'll load a patch and I have a whole bunch of themes in it that are for this theme. But within those themes, because he uses random systems, how you start a rhythm is what dictates the new motif. What right. you play straight out of the gate dictates the motif, not the, mo not the machine. You dictate the motif, and then once it starts its pattern, you could find your areas within there and create a brand new composition out of thin air on the same set of patches with the same, you know, trance groove going on in the background, and then up, you know, the game with the trance groove as well. Do the same thing where you're choosing different beats or sticking them in, and you know, like looping situations like guitarists do with their loop box. See a lot more drummers doing that. Um, right. Other than that, man, I just see players getting better. Really, trust. Just better. Mm -hmm. Man, I mean, come on, dude. How old are you? 41. Oh, I had to look in your screen over there because the screen's over there. You look great, dude. Thanks, All bro. Right. I appreciate you. Hey, man, look at not bad for 41, right? Go watch Tosh the Drummer on, on uh, Instagram. He's like one of my favorite <laughs> Instagram right. people, but he's also killing it in LA, dude. And you're like, man, I need to up my game. <laughs> I, need, I, should, I probably should go practice. Uh, right. uh, the young gospel traps drummers coming up. They're just amazing. They're just so much control over their instrument. And there's so much more information and knowledge out there allowing drummers to study their craft mm -hmm. directly. Like coming up, when I was coming up, finding a good drum teacher in Houston was hard. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wanted to learn jazz, you had to go all the way downtown to the snooty jazz teachers. Because <laughs> none of the suburban guys did that. We all did Van Halen. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but what I've found has changed in general is that players seem to have more of a stake in what they're doing. Like they really know their, their song even if, or their craft within their band. Mm -hmm. Or if they're an individual player, they're just great, man. Mm -hmm. They have a whole vibe going on. And I see a lot of players really investing in their own stuff. Like you listen to someone like Kaz or Boots. They don't sound like Aaron. Aaron and Kaz will shred in the same way, but they don't sound the same. No. And uh, that's what makes all these players beautiful, man. It's just amazing. Plus, more of them have it together. Everyone's getting on top of their game, man. Like you, like their personal game, business game, personal game, and business game and craft game. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they're they're yeah. into their craft and developing their craft for the music and for themselves. They're into the business side. They understand, you know, how to not get fired from a gig. Right. The ones who don't don't last long. Mm -hmm. But also, I think it's that they're they're more aware of their gear. They're more aware of their technology. They're more aware of what makes it work which is great for me because i don't want to feel like i'm fooling anybody i want to be so on point mm -hmm. that my artist is literally blown away by how much i know their game so mm -hmm. we can just fuse this one and that way they don't it, it my job is to be at one with their mind when their mind goes maybe i oh mm. <laughs> ah man the symbols come a little ah <laughs> hey man i wanted a little more did he just fix my mix without saying anything? Yeah, if I fixed your mix, bro. I saw your face. I was like, man, that hi-hat don't sound right today. Hey, man, could you raise the on the hi-hat? Thank you. And I come back, and they're all like, well, I guess, yeah. That was totally what I was thinking, and that's my gig. That's what I want to do. I want to get inside their brain so they don't have to think. They just play. That's beautiful, man. So what is, um, what's next for you? Um, next up is the last run with the Grateful Dead. Now I'm gonna, I'm right now I'm, I'm home, you know, uh, mm -hmm. doing some work here. I'm teaching a ton and I'm actually doing a lot of local tech work in the studios who have been waiting for me to come for tour. <laughs> so, uh, I'm doing that and I'm releasing a whole new drum tuning series on the power tone kit where I really get into the nitty gritty of going from a ground to sound on a 12, a 14, a 20, uh, and a brass six and a half by 14 power tone or not power tone super 10 and then i'm gonna make like a little package with my eight lug power tone tuning video to where i can make a really precise concise head to toe bottom head top head package for students to to stream and learn better how to tune their gear how to tune their drums get the sounds they want because 
that's kind of what I made the videos, man. I give a lot on my YouTube channel, but there's more to know. Yeah, I was just going to say we should talk about that because your, your YouTube channel is amazing. And I didn't, I purposely didn't sort of engineer questions around it because I don't want to, like, you, you're obviously selling a lot of content, but you have a lot of amazing free content for people. Like, Thank you, you all should check out this Kenny's YouTube channel because it is amazing. And there's like days and days of videos to go and watch. <laughs> uh, but, so, like, what do you with your lessons that that are on your site? Let's talk. T take me. What what what's the crack? What's the story? Like, tell people, sell it to them. I know, and, and so here's the deal. A lot of people are like, "Well, what do you really do in those lessons?" And the reality is, I help you learn how to tune your kit. And we tune your kit on the spot. Ninety percent of the time, by the time we're done with two hours, you got three times the snare drum dialed, and we've probably dug into your bass drum and kind of freshened it up a bit. Mm -hmm. But my goal in these lessons is to teach you the skills hands-on how to do what I do, how to understand the two-key method, how to understand interval tunings. Like, uh, you know, a lot of times I want a warmer, rounder sound, I'll use a major third where this is tonic and this is a major third above. Mm -hmm. And it's a warm, round sound. Mm -hmm. But maybe I want a little bit more bite, but I don't want to change the tension of my top head. I'll raise that bottom head, tighten up the sustain to a perfect fourth. That way it is a little bit more attack, tighter sustain. Maybe not as warm and round, but it gets the job done. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the goal to teach you how to do that. But also, most importantly, the thing I enjoy about my lessons the most is I'm helping you get your drum sound. Right. You know what I mean? Like to that's see it. the drummers not only get a great drum sound, they're like, great. Oh, man, I'd love it a little higher. Well, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And then we, I walk you through and you use the methods and you're like, Kenny, I'm doing it. And I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> and I've been trying to do this all my life and now I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that's really what's happened. A lot of drummers are afraid to take lessons because they, they don't want their knowledge base threatened or shamed. And, yeah, right. man, I ain't about shame, dude. I'll tease you once in a while because I'm a roadie. I'm a tech for the dead, dog. I get to tease you once in a while. We're just having fun. But the, the, the thing is I've been doing it for 22 years. So for me, I'm just clowning to make a point that, please, open your heart and your mind. I ain't going to judge you. I don't care, man. You came to me to learn. And so I want you to find that drum sound. And uh, I've actually done a series with a lot of drum techs recently where we tuned their kit at home after they got home from tour. And they're looking at it just dead silent. I'm like, what's wrong? And they were like, dude, I didn't think it would work. I thought you were just going to be another pile of mumbo jumbo. I've done other drum tuning lessons. And they, it was just nothing I didn't already know or didn't really help me. You, I've never heard my kids sound like this. This wow. works. And we did it every single time on every single drum. And I'm like, I know, right? He's a, he's a pro touring tech with a top act. He wants lunch. I want lunch. Yeah, right. Lunch. <laughs> so, that, yeah, I teach you how to get to lunch quicker. But it's all about crafting a tone. Because then, like, like you said, in this room, I liked this for the studio. But when I went to this barn, which had a hay floor and wood walls, it just fell dead. So I had to raise the pitch a little bit mm -hmm. of the drums and... Get a little more bite. Oh, I want to do that quickly. Well, with my system, you can. Mm -hmm. With what I teach you, you can. It's like literally tuning a guitar. Right. And that's kind of the point I try to make to people is that tuning to notes is relative. Tuning to a balanced head with a solid pitch is everything. Mm -hmm. I don't need it to be a perfect C. But say it's a little sharp of a C, just a little off, and I make a major third between the two, I want you to know that you make that major third perfect where the E's a little bit sharper on that major third from a C to an E. That'll sound better than this yeah. being a perfect E and this being off. Making yeah, right. that interval perfect and balanced open tones on your heads. This whole tune the tension rod someplace else to kill sustain crap just makes me want to weep. Because in the end, the sustain is still going, bro. It's still going. The only difference, instead of it going, boom, and it sounds like this. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's better. Ah, that, tune that down. You know, and I do like the old tune down too a little bit or just make them wrinkle and you get the doo, mm. especially if you got the Pina Colada song mm. on the <laughs> list that night. Doom, 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 if you like Pina, you know, go, man, do it. Yeah. But in the end, what I find is that, and uh, I did a video that I was never able to put out, so I'll do it again, but in, the concept was, you know, Big Fat Snare Drum will make a crappily sound snare, tune snare sound good, right? Mm -hmm. But what it does for a properly prepared and tuned instrument, right, 
if that's the sound you looking for, you get it perfect and you pop that big fat snare drum donut on, you're like, <laughs> donut done, dog, done. And everyone's walking around going, the snare sound of heaven. Nobody's going, <laughs> yeah, you put some muffling on that. Some crusty guy in the corner all, I don't know, I never put muffling on my drums. Sweep, <laughs> sweep, sweep. <laughs> And uh, I mean, see, I'm, I'm, thank you for laughing because I mean it from the bottom of my heart with happiness. A lot of guys got their tuning information from a dude named Chad who was taking bong hits in between uh, versions of Iron Man because he knows the drama area so well. He's going to show off now. The chicks really dig it. Iron Man. <laughs> dude, what you want to do? Now, get your tuning advice from people who actually tune drums for a living. Yeah, you know, even and, and or play drums for a living, at least in a context where they have to apply things like a microphone or mm. adapting to a room, man. And take your time to learn how to do it, because in the end, in a lesson, you're gonna walk away with your kit tuned. You're gonna laugh, yeah. And you're gonna walk away with a lot of knowledge that reinforces all the good things you know about tuning and gets rid of all the bad things. Like I don't want to take away your treasures. I want to show you how to take the treasures and things you've learned to get the sound you want and use them in conjunction with what I do to get your sound mm. to where you walk in and your kit's tuned. I mean, it means it actually means the world to me. I have two students who took drum tuning lessons and they both played at the same club one night. And the one drummer went up to the other drummer to tell him how good his drums sound <laughs> and, and at sound check. And the other guy was like, your drums sounded great at uh, sound check. He goes, man, Kenny Sherrits, you went to Kenny Sherrits? And they started <laughs> talking about it, dog. <laughs> Amazing. Dude, come on. It doesn't get any better than that to know that these drummers are out there getting killer sounds. Sound guys are flipping out. Everyone happy band is tripping. Everyone's loving it because they took the time to take a lesson, man. Yeah. Uh, cause it'll change the game. And you know, people who say, well, tuning is relative and tuning, you tune it kind of where you want. Yeah, that's true. For some situations, you may not want a big open sound, mm -hmm. but in that context, if you have a properly tuned drum and then do some of that little key mojo, that's where you can get the mojo where you're like, Hey man, it may not be perfect, but listen to that thief, thief. And then you get a great sound, but it wouldn't sound that way if the drum wasn't balanced. It wouldn't sound that way if it wasn't tuned to begin with. Yeah. Start with a balanced instrument and then mess with it and you can get some killer sounds. But using it as an excuse to not know, to, that because you don't know, you know it's, it's, it's how I tune. Yeah. Great, right. man, but it doesn't sound good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man, it's, I just do a little this, a little that. You know, it's, it's all about the situation. No. <laughs> no, it's not, bro. It means you don't know how to tune a drum. That's okay. Don't be afraid. Just come and hang and let's, let's figure it out. And that way you walk around going, I can tune a drum. And you're happy about it. You're like next level. And then you can hand that down to generation after generation. So people going forward hear great sounding drums for the rest of uh, mankind's life rather than some of the things we've put up with over the years. You know, Beautiful. growing the art, growing the instrument, you know. Because yeah. uh, if I walk into a pub and I hear a, a well-tuned kit, I'm going to be happy, man. I'm going to yeah. stick around, have a couple of pints, do the do, you know. So... Kenny Sharrets dot com. Sharrets is spelled S H A W R E W T S dot com is where you can find that. Yeah, actually, Kenny Sharrets dot com. Uh, you could book online lessons with me, and again, we could do them in Skype and Zoom. I have my little piano <laughs> right here, so you can learn some ear training. Because here's the other thing: I don't just teach you how to tune a drum. I teach you how to train your ears to tune a drum. Mm -hmm. I teach you how to join your ears with your hands and your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, and people are like, "Why do you tune drums to notes?" Well. That's the pitch that the drum's giving me, and now I know it's a C. Now my ears know it's a C, which means my brain knows it's a C. So if I have that, and then I go to my drum, and one of the tension rods sounds like this, I know that's not a C. When all the other ones sound like this, and that last one's just all, you know where to go. But the best part is, say you hear this. Uh, on all your drums, on all your drums, and you hear this. You know that one's out of tune, don't you? Yeah, right. But if you didn't prepare your ears, you don't know nothing. You can kind of hear it, but preparing your ears lets you know what is high, what is low, or what is actual pitch I want. A lot yeah. of drummers will go, man, that's low, and that's high after hitting two tension rods. No, man, hit the whole drum. Check out the whole drum, and that's kind of what I teach you in the lessons. The craft of looking at your drum as a complete instrument, the geometric patterns that help you overcome standard uh, issues when you've played a drum all night and you got to play it the next night. You're like, well... What happened to it? Well, this is what happened to it because I have to do 
clean up for you every night. It's what I do. So here, let me give it to you. This is the knowledge I want to give you. And then there's also step-by-step lessons that, A, you know, going to teach you a lot. And they're all fairly priced. Uh, You can stream in the privacy of your own home and do it as you wish without anyone judging you. And just kind of embrace what I do and kind of go with me on each one. There's there's tunebot settings, drum dial settings, pitches, everything you need, graph guides, what, little geometric mm-hmm. guides to walk you through it. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of get in the vibe. And once you get in the vibe, you're like, I got this. I got mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times people will watch my videos and then book a lesson. And yo, that mm-hmm. is so effective that later they're just texting me going, drums sound great. Love you, Kenny. Boom. <laughs> You know, one lesson in a couple of videos and they've won and they're getting the drum sound they want. And so, I mean, it's, it's, there's just, I have no time to lie. I have to stand in front of Stevie Wonder and, and sound great. I, I, otherwise I'm fired. I have to make sure that stuff right sounds right for Rihanna. I don't have time to hear what Jared had to say about drum tuning. You know what I mean? (laughs) You know, so I, 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 I can't be wrong or I am fired, you know? And so... But more importantly, I found that when people stream the lesson or watch the channel and then come take a lesson, man, that knowledge goes right in and it becomes worth it because it's also a great way to support what I do. Like nobody support. This is all me. I make all the videos myself, write the content, do the lighting, do the filming. Somebody else sometimes will push record at the recording studio, but I mic them, I measure them. It's literally all me, all the advertising, everything, all of it. Well, man. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate you coming on. I've had such a good laugh. I've learned so much. Um, man, I'm I'm yeah. glad. I'm, I yeah. hope you have, man. Yeah, you know. absolutely, absolutely. This has been one of my favorite episodes I've done. Um, it's been really insightful. So I really appreciate you taking the time out. Um, where are you on the socials game? Uh, on the socials game, you find me at Kenny Sherritt's drum page on Facebook. Please give me a follow. Uh, yeah. Kenny Sherritt's on Instagram. Great. Kenny Sherritt's on YouTube. And KennySherritt's.com. That's where you can find them. They're kind of all fused together. You can find me anywhere on any of those places. Please DM me if you want to talk about lessons, talk about drumming. Uh, it's, it, this is what I do. I'm trying to be the drum tech for every drummer in the world, y'all. Hell yeah. Well, if you're ever in town, please come say hello. Let us know. We'll come. We'll hang. We'll, whatever. We'll go for a pint. Just It would be great to catch you if you're ever in Glasgow. Man, that's dude, I love that city so much. I've had town, so right? many great times. It's a wonderful town, man. And yeah. uh, I look forward to hopefully getting back there one day soon because it now with COVID receding, I can go back out again once in a while. So yeah, yeah right. one of my favorite things in the pub, <laughs> pub in Scotland, bro. Well, Good do times, it, man. Dude. We'll do it. And um, we'll just uh, hopefully catch you down the road. Sounds wonderful, my brother. You take care. You too. See you, man. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Drummers Only Podcast. Please leave us a review and make sure you subscribe. If you need any more information about us or any gear mentioned, head on over to drummersonly.co.uk and make sure you follow us on all of our social channels at Drummers Only UK. Thanks for listening. Peace.